our, our food supply really depends upon uh, a few inches of topsoil, which are disappearing, and a handful of seeds, which are also disappearing, and a little bit of water, which, by the way, happens to also be disappearing. I'm not certain why it hasn't shown up sooner, but for a long time, the world has actually been eating more than we've been able to produce. There isn't a surplus of food. Less and less, it's a system designed to maximize production of food, and more and more, it's a system designed to maximize the production of profits. Food. Our lives depend on it. In the supermarket, it looks like there's a lot of food. But is this abundant supply of inexpensive food an illusion? We have a food system that literally runs on oil. Our crops are at risk from climate change, and we're losing control of our food supply. Our food supply is at risk. Um, with the demands of climate, without the demands of climate change, we'd be in trouble. It's not just climate change or the price of oil that now threatens our food supply. It's those who want to control it. From the seeds we plant, to the crops we grow, to the food on our tables, the future of our food supply is being hijacked. Yeah, it's probably a surprise to, to most people who live in cities still that, that, that our, our food supply really depends upon uh, a few inches of topsoil, which are disappearing, and, and a handful of seeds, which are also disappearing, and a little bit of water, which, by the way, happens to also be disappearing. It's a very fragile base of, of, of raw materials that they get food on the table every, every year. And uh, probably of all of those areas, soil, topsoil, and water, seeds are really the most vulnerable. Uh, they, they've been disappearing rapidly and, and are continuing to evaporate around us every growing season. Terry Baim is one of those people who grow our food. For four generations, this farm has supported his family and helped feed us. It's spring and time to plant seeds. Seeds he saved from last year's crop. But every year, there's a lot that can go wrong. You'll never know what the weather will do to you. You can have a hail storm and, and have your crop destroyed that looks wonderful. Uh, early frost, uh, droughts uh, can, can take away your year's work. But what's happening uh, is the ability of me to be able to control some of my costs and uh, by seed saving and doing what farmers have always done is being infringed upon. And indeed, uh, uh, multinational companies uh, have recognized how much wealth can be generated by control of the seed. And when they have control of the seed, they'll have control of the food system and how your food is produced. I did the calculation the other day. If the entire world adopted the North American system of producing and preparing and transporting and consuming food, it would literally liquidate the global oil supply in 44 years. That is how vastly unsustainable our high energy use agriculture is. It takes more than seeds to get food on our table. Our industrial food system depends on oil, fuel for machinery, petroleum-based pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers, fuel to transport our food. We literally have a food production system that stretches from uh, oil fields at one end to the drive through restaurant at the other. When you look at that chain, three things stand out. The first thing is, at every link in that chain, you've got a tiny number of dominant corporations, transnationals. The second thing you notice is that the players in that chain are really, really big. And the third thing you see in the, this chain is that it's characterized by massive profitability. Uh, 2004 and 2005, these were years of record profits for the vast majority of the corporations that make up the agri-food chain. The seeds we plant, the crops we grow, the food we eat, Everything is affected by the concentration of control. It dates back to the beginning of the 20th century because at that time, seeds were still in the hands of farmers. It was farmers who were leading all the innovation with seeds, who were developing, adapting, selecting for um, mostly the local food needs because it was uh, we had local food systems at that time. But at the beginning of the 20th century, 
You had a move on the part of the Canadian state and business to try to develop um, a national agribusiness. This industrialization of agriculture profoundly changed how we farmed, what we ate, and how we grew our food. Assembly lines at the new food processing plants wanted uniform sizes and uniform tastes. Mechanization, probably the most significant change in 10,000 years of agriculture, even changed the crops we grew. New abundance, but at a price. If you look at the last century, the first thing that happened was farmers were sold uh, energy, power, you know, get rid of the horses, get, get the tractor. You know, a positive step, perhaps. But then the next thing it was fertility, uh, chemical fertilizers in the wake of World War II. Yeah, everything would have been, you know, basically organic up until the advent of the post-World War II chemicals left over uh, fuel for, for, for bombs, for ammunition, all those kind of things, and, and the scientific labs that were, I guess, initially working towards this idea that you know, we can probably tweak a lot of things with science. This is crazy. You know, we can't be using stuff that was meant <clears throat> in, in maybe in a warfare situation to be using this to produce food. Crazy? Perhaps. Yields did improve with chemical herbicides and fertilizers, but farmers had to buy them each year. A big change from the old ways. What was next? And then the next thing that had to be replaced was farmers' self-supply of seed, and that was turned into something that you sell to farmers. And it wasn't in immediately clear how they were going to do that with seeds, because farmers can really supply that well and very efficiently for themselves. But what the industry did was they started to set up a whole bunch of impediments and roadblocks to just make it harder and harder and really drive the farmers increasingly into the arms of the people that want to sell them seeds. For 10,000 years, farmers have planted crops and saved their seeds. How do you undo 10,000 years of agriculture? How do you prevent farmers from saving seeds? The companies began by telling us in the 1970s will never interfere with the farmer's right to be able to save and exchange seed. That's, that's an inalienable right of the farmer. By the 1980s, they were saying the farmer's privilege to be able to save and exchange seed. By the 1990s, they were saying farmers are pirating our seeds if they save and exchange them. And now, in country after country, they're saying this is illegal, they have to be stopped, and even talking about criminal liability if farmers steal their seeds. My great-grandfather started in, in this area, my grandfather, and uh, my father still farms and uh, close to 4,000 acres, which is sort of medium-large for uh, Canadian prairies. When agricultural production is totally controlled from, from the seed to the plate, uh, that control is going to result in, in really huge profits for somebody and it's not going to be the guy sitting down for dinner and it's not going to be the farmer. If you add up farmers net farm incomes since 1985 you come up with zero. There hasn't really been a dollar made since the mid 80s. But if you add up the value of the farmer's production since 1985, if you add up their gross revenues, it comes up to two-thirds of a trillion dollars. Where'd the two-thirds of a trillion dollars go if farmers kept zero? It went to the people that sell us our energy, our chemicals, our seeds, our technologies. That two-thirds of a trillion dollars has been captured by the transnational input companies and not one dime has stayed on Canadian farms over that 20-year period. Uh, if there was an award for wealth extraction, I mean, that, that is an Academy Award-winning performance in terms of wealth extraction. They are 100% successful. Wait a minute. How are corporations extracting such huge profits from farming? Back in the 1970s, there were 65 major pesticide companies in the world. Today, you can just barely come up with 10 companies. 
total and really involved in pesticides that have any significant influence at all. Those 10 companies together have well over 80% of the global pesticide market. But more importantly, if you look at the, the leading seed companies and the leading pesticide companies, they're the same companies. It's Monsanto, it's Syngenta, it's DuPont, it's Dow. Uh, they're really, the, and, and BASF and so on, that are really the dominant companies here. So they've, they've got a complete merger of these interests. And you can go beyond that and look as well from there, at, well, who are the major veterinary medicine companies? And who are the major companies that are involved in livestock breeding and livestock genomics? And again, it's the same companies. So across the board, we're, see, we're seeing a control of not just the first link in the food chain as seeds, but the control in the breeding of livestock, control in the veterinary medicines, and all of the other chemicals related to crops and livestock. You know, the uh, pharmaceutical industry is one of the most profitable industries in the world. Many of those companies are also involved in agricultural uh, herbicide chemical production. And they're also very interested in seeds right now, and, and also involved in that. And they're certainly not looking at it to earn any less profits than they are in pharmaceuticals. By making seeds dependent on specific pesticides, corporations realized huge profits. Sales of agricultural chemicals have more than tripled in the last 10 years. Pesticide companies saw the opportunity to take over the, the seed business and saw the value for them to control both pesticides and seeds together. So they moved aggressively in to take over the industry. In let's say the late 1970s, mid to late 1970s, there were probably around the world around 7,000 different seed sources, both public and private uh, companies that were marketing seeds to farmers. We've now moved from that to where 10 years ago, we had the top 10 seed companies on the planet controlling between 25 and 30% of the commercial seed market. And today, the top 10 companies control about 55% of the global commercial seed market. And within a few years, it'll probably be down to seven or eight companies controlling 70 or 80% of the global seed market. Fewer and fewer companies control more and more of the food chain, from fertilizers and chemicals to the seeds tied to those chemicals. Fewer choices for farmers, less variety. Is this a problem for our food system? The most fundamental level of control in, in nature today is control of the atoms. And so now patents are being granted on, on really the, the elements of the periodic table and how they, how they can be used. And the patents are being granted on new structures of atomic material and DNA that we've never even seen before and can't imagine. We think it's very scary and the world's not paying attention to it. The same as the way the world didn't pay attention when they were warned about biotechnology back in the 1970s, uh, now government regulator, regulators and farmers are not paying attention to the fact that, that we're, we're moving way beyond the idea of single gene transfer into the idea of build your own life form. We saw just a few months ago, in fact, the, the, the announcement um, of a patent application by Craig Venter, who was the scientist who developed the private sector side of the Human Genome Project, where Venter applied for a patent on the first synthetically created life form, a bottom-up built, never seen before, human-made, uh, self-replicating life form, which has never been done before. I mean, for the first time in history, if Craig Venter can do this, God is competition. Now you can patent a gene, insert that gene into a plant, and all of a sudden any plant, any seed that contains that gene, is suddenly the property of the patent owner. This is the Percy Schmeiser case where uh, his crop was contaminated from neighboring fields with uh, the Roundup Ready gene, which is owned by Monsanto, patented by Monsanto. Suddenly his entire crop is Monsanto's property. And this was, a, this was upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada. The genes in genetically modified canola have been patented, and in 2004, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the gene belongs to the patent owner. It doesn't matter how the gene got into the crop, it's theirs, and farmers could be sued for patent infringement. The Schweizer case is important, but it's also just the tip of an iceberg. Uh, the evidence is that dozens and probably hundreds of farmers have been visited by the owners of patents. And uh, when those companies come calling, they have incredibly big sticks to use against farmers. 
uh, all they need to do is allege patent infringement. The farmer is then put in a very, very difficult situation. He or she, uh, potentially innocent, could go to court to try and prove that they hadn't infringed a patent. But uh, the experience of the Schmeiser case and others shows that that's a hundred or two hundred thousand dollar bill to, just to pay for the, the legal costs, and you may or may not win. Uh, essentially, these are farm destroying amounts of money. Yeah, I mean, they fiddle with them a little bit. They add a gene here, adjust something there, but really, they're they're stealing. They're stealing the heritage of mankind, and they're selling it back to us for a hell of a profit. And uh, and there's so much wealth to be generated that there's no holds barred. I mean, we're in a we're in a real battle here now around the world for control of of seeds for that for that fundamental of agriculture and life. What we've learned uh, with biotechnology is that you don't have to do good science and certainly you don't have to do good technologies in order to make lots of money, to make a real big profit. Uh, here we have with, 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 uh, with biotechnology, a technology which is clearly flawed, which is clearly pushed into the marketplace years ahead of its, of its time to do that. They have tried to prove to Wall Street they could have a, a product, tried to convince investors it was worth investing in them, so they dumped a sloppy technology on farmers in the hopes that they could get away with it. And they have. In fact, what they've done with this very messy technology, is, which again serves no useful purpose for anybody, is that they've created a contamination which gives them more profits. It's a process of constantly upping the ante, of making it more and more difficult until we have a situation like it is now where it's virtually a crime to save your seeds. Because on one level they can go to the courts and say, hey, those farmers have got my variety there, a lot of the Percy Schmeiser case. And secondly, once people find themselves faced with GM contamination, they kind of throw up the, their hands and say, okay, we might as well buy the seeds. So, so they create the market for themselves. And thirdly, they're doing which, the most amazing thing of all, which is the, the saying, gee, we have a problem with GM contamination, we have a solution for you. The solution will be that we're going to give you a seed that dies at harvest time, terminator seed, uh, so that the pollen can't spread to other varieties or neighboring fields. And so therefore, uh, we won't have any GM contamination. Do you really expect the people who caused the problem to solve the problem for you? Do you really want to trust them who made the sloppy mess in the first place to clean up the mess? I want to charge them to clean up the mess, but I don't want to trust them to clean up the mess. Secondly, um, you know, we don't know that Terminator would ever work. It's simply a theory at this stage, and probably would be like the first technology. It means it really won't work very well, or it'll work half well, and we'll simply find ourselves with suicide seeds around the planet. And the third thing is that 1.4 billion human beings depend upon farmer-saved seed for their food security every year. They're at risk with this new technology, and we can't afford it. If anyone looks at the morality and the ethics uh, of something like creating sterile seeds, you know, mass-producing sterile seeds, to what end? What end? To enrich a few companies, nothing else. It has nothing to do with food safety, food security. Now, corporations will say, well, we work according to the market, but if you actually look at the research they're doing in seeds, most of it is directed at making seeds sterile, so developing hybrid crops, developing genetically engineered crops that uh, farmers cannot save seed from, from year to year. They have to sign these onerous contracts that prevent them from doing so. And when pesticide corporations came in, they had very specific objectives in mind because they knew that their, many of their, their blockbuster patents, uh, pesticides were coming off patent, so they were looking for ways to protect their markets. Patrick Steiner is an organic farmer and a seed grower in Sorrento, British Columbia. He grows organic vegetables for local markets and sells seeds to other growers throughout the country. All of the new varieties of vegetables that are being grown are either hybrids, which effectively makes them impossible for other people to save, or they are subject to plant breeders' rights, which effectively makes them illegal for other farmers or people to save. And so it's a way of um, retaining control and ownership of these vegetable seed varieties that we haven't really seen in the past. For example, in Canada today, there's no laws that require genetically engineered food that's available on our shelves to actually be labeled. So we have no idea what we're eating, if it's genetically engineered or not. The companies that control all these various parts of the food system are so large at this point that they can lobby the governments. They're such a strong voice, the government doesn't feel they can do anything to actually require them to label things. So at this point, 
the general population is less important to the government than these transnational corporations. That's, that's a big impact, in my opinion, when we're not listen, being listened to by our own governments. So the major trend we're seeing with the corporations now is, is to say, let's, 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 let's go below the, below the radar screen even of, of the patent system and, and of uh, government regulators by really trying to manipulate the ownership of the DNA. And if you can actually atomically modify a plant instead of genetically modify a plant, uh, th then, then you have a level of control there that you'd never have any other way. And, and we're seeing the movement directly toward that now with a huge investment of money uh, in that field in the last uh, just a couple of years. What I've got here in just one of these bags is millions upon millions of seed. And you'd be surprised at how, mu how many fields of arugula you could plant out of a, a bag this small. While it's so small and you can pick this up and, and put it away somewhere, you have the potential for vast quantities of food. Uh, each single one of these little tiny seeds is, in fact, a plant, but just in a different stage of its life. Once the seed is exposed to the right environment around it with oxygen, moisture, and nutrients in the soil, it can sense that and it starts to sprout a little taproot that seeks nutrients. It starts to put out its first leaves. It starts to photosynthesize. And within a matter of weeks, you have an edible plant that can nourish your body. Seeds can grow plants, nourish our bodies. But for others, seeds can be a source of profit and control. We're risking a lot here. We're losing control of the food supply. We're increasingly transferring from a system designed to produce food to one that's designed to produce profits. We're in the fastest food supply drawdown in probably a century right now. In seven out of eight years, the world has consumed more food than it produced. And then we've got climate change bearing down on us. It's almost like a perfect storm. Climate change is here. We can no longer ignore it. Climate change makes all other problems worse. We are seeing this incredible collapse of our flexibility in the food system. With climate change, we're really putting humanity at, at high risk here. We've only got a couple of decades to try to figure out what to do about this and to, to move back to a system or move forward to a more creative system in which farmers are really full players and directors of the research initiatives we need to have to get ourselves through climate change. They're the ones that got the expertise. If we don't... In the prairies, we have tended to plant just a few varieties of wheat, for example, that were popular at any given snapshot in time. And we carry that on, but we understand that that's not, not uh, particularly when confronted with um, climate change and, and uh, a bunch of other problems, that that's not a wise strategy. In the 1950s, wheat was the main crop in the Canadian prairies. Millions upon millions of acres, and most of it for export. The prairies were planted with very few varieties. With only a few varieties of wheat, a plant disease could spread quickly through the whole crop. And it did. The disease was stem rust of wheat. Devastation was huge. In about 1950, a new race of stem rust came along, which unfortunately was uh, virulent on almost every wheat variety in North America. And of course, this caused a great, a great panic because there was just nothing that could be grown. And unfortunately, the race 15B spread very quickly. These are plants that have been ruined by the disease known as stem rust of wheat. The economic loss was huge. Hundreds of millions of dollars in that one epidemic. The rust covered everything. And when the work was done, you were lucky if the quality was good enough for chicken feed. Lots of people didn't even bother. Figured they might just as well plow it under and try again next year. When I first started to look for resistance, we had some lines, and a number of them came, in fact, from Ethiopia. They were the Durham wheat, which is a different species than the ordinary bread wheat. Wheat has been growing for many years there, and I guess so over the years, the Ethiopian varieties have developed resistance to rust, and that's why we need to keep them in case in the future that some new problem comes along that we don't anticipate, and we can go back to these old varieties and try and find a source uh, of resistance to whatever the problem is. This frozen
frozen mountain north of the Arctic Circle in Norway will become the home of what's being called the Doomsday Vault. We want to preserve all these seeds for the possible use of future generations and what God created we should not be allowed to destroy. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault will be the ultimate safety net for the seeds of the world's food crops in case of a global catastrophe, such as severe climate change. This will be the last line of defense against extinction for all of the, um, the crop diversity that we, we have in the world today. So it's extremely important for future generations, for ourselves as well. Airlock doors lead to two chambers carved out of the rock deep in the permafrost. It's one of the safest places you can ever think of. The biodiversity of this Earth will be stored here at minus 18 degrees Celsius. This is going to be a facility that makes the scientists smile because it's just what we need and want. Canada's national gene banks, like others around the world, will be putting duplicates of their seed collections into the Doomsday Vault, seeds that could be the key to our future food security. But all gene banks are designed for safe storage, a backup, not evolution. But plants are dynamic, constantly changing and evolving to cope with new pressures, new diseases. And what the farmers are doing is far more important because a gene bank puts seed on ice and there's no guarantee if it's brought out of the gene bank 30 years later that it's going to be able to give us any help with the new conditions that they'll face in the field with new pests and new diseases because of climate change. Uh, the farmer's variety, because it's changing every growing season, adjusting to new conditions every growing season, will always be more useful than anything you'll ever find in a gene bank. Ethiopia. The crops that feed people here are the ones that have adapted and survived centuries of pests, diseases, droughts, and floods. They aren't dependent on oil-based chemicals and fertilizers or mechanization. They can grow in harsh conditions on marginal land, land we call too poor to farm. These seeds are resilient and diverse survivors, seeds that aren't connected to the price of oil. It's a different system here, and a different story. Our crops are dependent on oil, and our system is vulnerable to changing conditions. Ecosystems use diversity to, to maintain resilience. If there's a diverse mix of plants, if something changes suddenly, different plants come to the fore and the system kind of restores stability. But we're very quickly removing the diversity from the global crop mix and we're steadily reducing the number of plants and plant varieties upon which we base our food supply. At any time that would probably be a bad idea. But if we're also facing probably the most rapid and severe change in our climatic patterns in human history, uh, reducing biodiversity and thus reducing the resilience and that adaptability of our food system is absolute folly at this point. No one knows what climate change will bring to our food supply, but we do know what a food catastrophe can look like. Over 20 years ago, there was a severe drought, civil war, and famine in Ethiopia. Crops failed and failed again the next year. Some crop varieties were close to extinction. Only the small samples in the National Gene Bank were left. There were enough seeds to re-establish the crops. But Ethiopian scientists knew that something more than a gene bank was needed for a secure food supply. What was needed were ways for farmers to save enough seeds for next year's crop ways to improve those crops, and ways to preserve biodiversity. Ways to combine farmers' traditional knowledge with the work of scientists. So, the community seed banks were started with support from a Canadian development organization, USC Canada. These are living and evolving seed banks of locally adapted crops. The idea is simple. Make a place where farmers can safely store enough seeds for next year's crop, plus a reserve. 
Seeds are always here, seeds of different crops are always here up until the communities are sure that the rain is reliable, the planted seeds are growing up, and the seedlings are vigorous to produce, to grow up into new crops. These seeds are stored until the new crops are ripe, and the community is sure there will be enough food. It's only then that the stored seed will be taken to market. This kind of seed bank is an insurance policy, one that grows out new seeds every year. Seeds that are evolving to resist climate change and new diseases. Maintaining security for the food supply. Plants have this penchant for diversifying themselves. It's how they evolve, it's how they adapt to their changing landscape and changing pressures upon them. So every seed is, is unique in some ways, uh, at least that's how it's always been. They're social. Um, they're social in that people have always been there. Selecting for and encouraging that diversity and using that, that pension for diversity in one way or another to adapt uh, the plants to their own cultural needs, their own social economic needs, whatever it is, and, and also to, their, to the farms and, and again to the changing landscape. So it's, it's, seeds have always been a reflection of who we are and what our societies look like. I think that people will see less diverse things on their food plate from increasingly a narrower gene pool. And, uh, and they will see probably their foods produced in methods that when they understand how it's produced or how that variety came to be, that, uh, that they probably will not like. Most of the food that we eat today didn't come from North America. It came from places like this. Places where people and plants have evolved together for thousands of years. This is traditional, not industrial agriculture. It's an incredibly diverse landscape, and the plants here have evolved, reflecting that diversity. Over millennia, farmers have selected their seeds. Seeds that have adapted to this particular place. Seeds that will ensure their survival. Seeds saved freely. Seeds exchanged freely. No corporate control. In a single field, there will be several varieties of a crop. One that will do well if it's a dry year. One that's good for bread. And one that is resistant to insects. It's a system designed for resilience and survival. For today's North American farmer, it's a different system and a different story. Weather and pests and crop conditions affect all farmers and our food supply. Well, it's, uh, I don't know, it'll be slightly below average this year. We had uh, extreme heat through July and no rain. And uh, it's pretty difficult to grow a crop without a July rain. We've got sawfly damage in there. You can see the stalks leaning over on the ones that are standing tall. And so they've, this is a typical example where they've cut the stem off right at the base. There's just a myriad of things that can go wrong. And it actually really points to how fragile uh, food production really is. Food production in Ethiopia is fragile too. Here, farms are small and the land often marginal. There's little industrial scale agriculture. Most of the crops grown here are farmers varieties that have adapted to local conditions. But like everywhere, conditions are changing, so new varieties need to be developed. Crops need to be improved. In these plots, some varieties of wheat from other areas are being tested to see how they'll perform in this environment. There are test plots like these all over the world. 
But the difference here is that there's a partnership between farmers and scientists. Knowledge and seeds are exchanged freely. Everyone benefits. It is one of the components of the on-farm crop genetic resource conservation strategy in Ethiopia. And why should we care about biodiversity in Ethiopia? There's lots of variety in food everywhere. We need biodiversity and farmers have been, they've been custodians of biodiversity. They've crossed and breeded and saved seeds and, and uh, have been absolutely essential in, in having that, that basic material in place and growing so that when we encounter disease problems, when we encounter rusts and changes and strains and insect problems and whatnot, that we can go back and we can source and breed and cross through, uh, through those techniques, eliminate some of the very tenuous risks of, of producing food in the world. I think the challenge you face is becoming quite common elsewhere. And there are challenges also that are common that we are facing. So I think that is possible to do the same thing in Canada. It is simply restoring systems. Give it back to nature, nature will adjust it. We are not masters of nature. This barley is ready to straight cut just about uh, any time now. The world will not mourn the loss of two or three international seed companies. The world will eat and live and get up the next morning if they happen to fall away because we've decided that intellectual property rights and, and gene patents are no longer appropriate in relation to seeds and food. I don't think the world will mourn the loss of these entities at all. The rise in popularity of farmer's markets, the rise in popularity of weekly box programs where the farmer delivers food directly to the consumer, that in the last 10 years has just skyrocketed. Farmer's markets are out of control. I mean, we can't, every single farmer at my farmer's market here in Serrano sells out every single week. We can't meet, up, we can't meet the demand that's out there right now. And all I, all I think is we just need to encourage that kind of direct contact between farmers and eaters, let's say, or consumers of food. And we'll be building a much stronger and, and healthier and more secure food system in this country. Food security in Ethiopia, Canada, or anywhere else questions a basic issue. Who do the seeds really belong to? Seeds belong to farmers because farmers produce seed, farmers nurture it, farmers develop variety. And the ownership is of farmers and the right to decide on how to maintain it, how to use it, still is of farmers. This should be recognized and it is wise to recognize this ownership right. For Asia, her family, her neighbors, her community, life comes from the seeds. Can we find uh, enough consensus and enough political will to transform agriculture once again? To get out of the rut we're in, to get out of the constant crises, to get out of this increasing division between rich and poor in our, in our food system, the increasing division between rural and urban. Can we somehow get out of that and say we need a new vision? We need a new vision that starts probably from the seeds. It's the farmers on the periphery 
who are not in the crosshairs of the multinational corporations all the time, who are the ones who are really responding to climate change, are the ones who are really trying to maintain the diversity and are going to give us a chance to survive in this world. And I have a lot of faith in what they're doing and, and their capacity to do it. Uh, I mean, there's brilliance out there. And many communities are doing that throughout the world, starting from that basis and saying, here's our diversity, here's our food system, this is our sustenance, this is our culture, this is our way of life, and here we are, we're going to, we're going to challenge the model that's being pushed down on our throats, we're going to come out with, we're going to come out with something new. We need to be tough with our governments. We need to be saying, get rid of this patent system that works against innovation and against the food supply. We need to be saying, break up these monopolies that are trying to control life. We need to be saying, pay attention to what's happening now with these new technologies that no one's looking at that are, are about to come up from under, under, underneath us, kind of, and take over the food supply. We need to be demanding uh, more support for community-shared agriculture. We need to be supporting uh, farmers that are trying to do that kind of work. Uh, we need to be doing more of our own conservation of food in our own, our own lives, looking for more diversity than what we buy in the grocery store. We need to be growing more of our own food in our own backyards, in our own flower pots, and wherever we can grow food. Uh, we need to be getting rid of green lawns and, and replacing them with, with uh, great food diversity, which is far more exciting to look at and far more useful to humanity and far more educational for our kids and far more nutritious for all of us. But if farmers on mass said tomorrow, well, the hell with your patents and plant breeders' rights, and we're just going to we're just going to plant what we feel like, when we feel like, how we feel like. All of those constructions will collapse overnight. Let's look at the Soviet Union. It looked like it was an invincible apparatus in place. You know, people on mass went to the streets, and and uh, and it just fell away. It all starts with the seed, and the stakes are high because who controls the seed controls the food. Who will control the seeds we plant and the food we put on our tables? Can we reclaim what's been ours for ten thousand years? Our food. Our lives depend on it.